Hi guys, how are you? I hope you're doing well and ready for chapter seven. So today we're going, we already talked about how microbes grow. So today we're gonna talk about how we can control how much they grow. So first we're gonna learn how they die to understand how we can kill them, right? All right, so let's look at our learning objectives. Um, so we have here some terms that we're gonna mention that we should define. Concept of sepsis and septicemia and bacteremia and all that. Um, what is the death curve, how they die, and what are the physical and chemical agents or methods that we use to kill microbes. So let's start by um, using some, you know, defining some terms that we should remember because they're going to come up later. One would be sepsis, where there is contamination by bacteria or by microbes, okay? Asepsis is the absence of significant contamination, okay? So when you use an aseptic technique, it does not mean that you're going to have a sterile, totally free um, of or microorganisms. It means most of those microbes are going to be dead, are not going to be present, right? So you're doing a septic, you're avoiding most of those microbes. Sterilization is, yes, the removal of all, all the microbes. Then you call it sterilization. Commercial sterilization is not killing all microbes, but for example, can kill Remember when we talk about endospores, and I said they can grow, Clostridium botulinum can grow in canned foods. This is one example where commercial sterilization would work and avoid this growth of Clostridium botulinum that can form endospores. Disinfection, destroying harmful microbes. Antisepsis, destroying harmful microbes on living tissue. Okay? Dejourning, mechanical removal of the microbes from a limited area. Sanitation, usually applied to conditions where, situations where you're trying to have eating utensils uh, safe from and free from microbes. When I say biocide or germicide is an agent that kills, side means kill the microbe or the germ, right? Germ is a general term for microbes. Bacteriostasis, stasis means stop the growth, okay? So this is inhibiting, not killing microbes. So it mostly stops the growth. Oops. Cool. So now let's talk about the death curve. The death curve is very similar to the growth curve. So if you remember that graph where we showed the lag phase, right? The lag phase and then the log phase, the stationary phase, whoops, and then the death phase. Remember when we're talking about number of microbes per time in the previous chapter? So the death curve is actually this part, right? So the same way we said that we need the microbes grow in an exponential type of scale, it's the same applies to the death curve. So when you look at a kill curve, look, it starts really high number of surviving cells. And then this is how surviving cell numbers is declining until it gets to a point we're not in zero here. But the number is so little compared to this log scale that you can't really see the phenomenon after three minutes, right? So what do you do? You apply a log, you put them in a scale of log base 10, and then by applying log to these numbers, you can see them as a line, and then you see the log decrease of the population, okay? So one thing that is important also about this is that if the if the death rate so assuming that in this graph you have two populations where the death rate 
is the same. What's gonna happen? You are not gonna be able to kill microbes in these two different populations with the same amount of time because one population has a lot more microbes than another one. So if you have more microbes, even with the same death rate, you're gonna take much longer than if you have less microbes. That's the concept, okay? So let's start, let me see if I missed something from learning objectives. Nope. Let's start talking about the agents. So the agents that we're going to talk about, most of them act the action that they, how do they kill microbes? By altering the membrane permeability or damaging proteins or nucleic acids. Usually the proteins that they damage are enzymes and then the met metabolism cannot, be, cannot function inside the microbe. So let's talk, start with the physical methods. So for physical methods, we had heat, filtration, and radiation. Heat usually denatures protein, so that's the action, right? So methods that are usually um, applied, that usually apply heat are autoclavation. What is an autoclave? It's a equipment that allows steam under pressure. So what happens is that this is an autoclave. So when you look at this chamber here, you see, this is the chamber where you're going to put your, what is going to be sterilized. And then the steam is going to flow through the system and there is also an exit here for waste. So there is a circulation of steam here that goes inside, meaning you could sterilize something solid, something liquid inside a bottle. Um, and you could, you know, just sterilize some equipment or some utensil. But when you use a bottle, this cap needs to be somehow loose. Loose. Okay, so if the cap is not loose, the steam doesn't get inside this bottle and then it's not gonna, gonna sterilize properly. Also, time is related to volume. So depending on the volume or the size of what you're going to sterilize, you need to apply different temperature and different time. So there are programs on the autoclave in the display that you pick for depending on the volume and the amount of what you're sterilizing and then you pick a different uh, um, program. See, large containers require long sterilization times. And then there are some test strips that we use, and I was talking about this, right? Depending on what you're gonna use, you know the volume, there is a different time that you use for that sterilization. You usually put, there are some tapes that you can put on the bottles or on the equipment that you're gonna sterilize. You can usually, if it's like a utensil, forceps, you can just wrap them in foil and you put a tape that when it is sterilized, it changes color so you know that the sterilization was effective. Another method that also applies heat is pasteurization. Pasteurization is used to usually reduce spoilage in food, okay? So you apply mild heat, less than 100 degrees Celsius, for not very long, um, I'm trying to think about here the time. For example, you can use this for milk and then you apply around 63 degrees for 30 minutes. So this is a proper sterilization time uh, by the pasteurization process, okay? Um, and then you're eliminating most of the microbes or the pathogenic microbes with this, you extend the shelf life, but you're not destroying all the microbes, okay? For example, in milk, you still want microbes that are probiotic to be present in the milk. So this type of procedure helps to not kill everything and also not to destroy or degrade your product. The milk or if it's a juice, it's also used uh, and you don't want to 
destroy that all the molecules from that juice that is going to alter color, alter taste. So that's why pasteurization is very important for food because you can still keep taste, color, appearance um, because you're not applying super high temperature. There are other methods that are also uh, apply that also apply heat. For example, ultra uh, high high temperature short time and ultra high temperature. These two procedures also are for shorter time, higher temperatures, but they are used for different things. They can also be used for food, but it's going to change a little bit and do similar things that than what the pasteurization does. Dry heat usually for materials right incineration when you want to for example material labs are always incinerated so you just turn them into ashes flaming we use this in the lab a lot right to flame our loops and our materials that we're using the mouth of our tubes that we're using during my our, our septic technique and you can also use hot air another physical method that is very efficient is filtration when you use a HEPA filter, what is HEPA? High efficiency particulate air. You are removing microbes that are smaller than 0.3 micrometer. Because if you look at these membrane filters, the, you see like it's a mesh, right? So each one of these little meshes, the little hole in the meshes is this size. So anything bigger than 0.3 micrometer is not going to pass through this filter. So you retain the bacteria on the filter and whatever flows through your liquid or whatever you're sterilizing is going to be sterile. This is one system for filter, filter sterilization. So the filter is here. This is the liquid that you want to sterilize. We usually use this for medium, for like um, a culture medium that you don't want to heat because it has growth factors, it has uh, substances that if you heat, they are uh, labile and they're gonna, they're heat labile and they're gonna uh, de be degraded. So when you use a filter, you don't need to worry about that. And then the bacteria are going to be retained here and whatever flows through is going to be sterile. Of course, this mesh is so small that for you to be able to push this liquid down, you need to apply vacuum, okay? Um, another physical method that is used, used sometimes is osmotic pressure. So you add sugars or salt to avoid some bacteria to grow because they dehydrate. Desiccation. So when there is no water present, you know how you have desiccated like silica that you add to, to products. You, if you open a medicine uh, flask, you see that little silica. So when you are avoiding the moisture in an environment, you're also avoiding microbes to grow. And then radiation. Ionizing radiation is more efficient, but more dangerous. So it ionizes the water to create hydroxyl radicals. And these free radicals are able to produce toxicity in the cell and damage a lot of different um, compounds of the cell and the metabolism cannot continue to happen, and then the bacteria die. Also damages the DNA by causing lethal mutations. Non, so that those are the, oops, those are the X-rays, gamma rays, electron beams. The non-ionizing radiation is the UV light. This is less dangerous, but more limited. So, for example, you cannot use non-UV light to sterilize a liquid inside a glass bottle or a plastic bottle because glass and plastic block the UV light so you're not going to be able to use in that situation. You can use for materials so it damages the DNA creating timing dimers. So what, is, what are the timing dimers? Remember how let's say you have the two strands of DNA here and then here let's say we have three bases here. A thymine and adenine and another thymine. So what are you gonna have in the other strand of your DNA here? An adenine, a thymine, and an adenine, right? The, if UV hits this part of this DNA, for example, this thymine is going to 
bind to that thymine instead of binding to their neighbor adenines, right? With that, this thymine dimer is going to misshape the DNA, and that's going to make, of course, the DNA non-functional and the bacteria is going to die. There are some microbes that have um, some repair mechanisms that undo this effect. So in that case, you would be dealing with microbes that are resistant to UV light. So that's why I'm saying that this ends up being less efficient than the ionizing radiation, even though it poses less risk to whoever is using it. Microwave is also killed by heat, but it's not especially antimicrobial, right? It's just a heat. Um, so things that are important when you are dealing, talking about using an, an effective disinfectant method is the concentration of your substances, of your substance, um, the organic matter, the pH, and the time. So you need to think about all this when you are um, selecting an agent. So there is a method that can be used not just for antimicrobial but also for disinfectants that is called the disdiffusion method. So when you look at this method, you are going to use a petri dish where you're going to culture your bacteria on that dish and then you're going to put these little discs like paper discs embedded in the drugs that you want to test or, you know, this, this substance. So, for example, this little disc is embedded with chlorine. This other one is embedded with hexachlorophane. This one is with a quaternary ammonium uh, soap. And then, before that, of course, you, like I said, you plate your bacteria on it. You see the bacteria growth here. So, where is the bacteria not growing? You see a halo here? So, anywhere... Here, in all this area, there is no growth. So what do you say? If the chlorine that was inside your disc was able to inhibit the growth at this halo of inhibition. So you measure the diameter of this um, halo to determine what is the zone of inhibition. Unfortunately for disinfectants, you can use the dis dis diffusion method, but it's really qualitative because you're not going to have a standard to compare that zone of inhibition, right? So here, oops, here the zone of inhibition would be this, right? Uh, you would not have like a way to compare this to a standard table that was, you know, determined. For antimicrobials, you do have standards to compare. Uh, in this case, it's more like, oh yes, it inhibited, it did not inhibit. So it's qualitative. Notice that bacteria like Pseudomonas, look how amazing this bacterium is. They are able to grow and eat these compounds. So they, they get so resistant to these compounds that they can live in soap. So none of them would be able to really kill bacteria with the exception of chlorine. Chlorine is always super effective. So this is a method that we use to determine the efficacy and the concentration, which if concentration would this, this drug be efficient. So now let's talk about these um, substances. So we have bisphenols, and one good example of bisphenol is the triclosan. This is um, a substance usually found in antibacterial soaps, body washes, toothpaste, paste, mouthwash, and they disrupt the plasma membrane, okay? So this is an effective substance in this type of, of, um, of products. Antibacterial soaps, it's contradictory, and I think most of the microbiologists would say it's not efficient because washing with a regular soap would remove the microbes anyway. So you don't need to add to a soap something that is going to kill microbes. So antibacterial soap is not really something smart, okay? It's kind of a waste because you're removing the microbes anyway. We're going to talk about how soaps act. So it would be more useful for mouthwashes, toothpaste, because then you are really wanting that antibacterial effect to, to stay in your mouth, right? 
you don't wash your mouth the way you wash your hands, right? It's much easier to remove something from your hand than from your mouth. Big one needs. So this one's, uh, the best example is chlorhexidine. And chlorhexidine is present in mouthwashes, also used to prevent gingivitis, just like triclosan. Skin scrubs and even pet shampoos can have chlorhexidine, okay? So in the surgical hand scrubs, that's efficient because you need the hands of uh, the staff that is about to start a surgery to be really clean. So you don't want to take chances here, but you should never use a chlorhexidine soap in your house, okay? It's not necessary. And it can be, even be too harsh for the skin because it's gonna end up removing the microbiota that you have on your skin. Okay, halogens. Remember, iodine, so these two, iodine and chlorine, are the main ones. Iodine is used usually as a tincture, and the main, the most effective way is when you combine iodine with organic molecules like povidone iodine, and they're used as um, hand scrubs too in a hospital setting for surgery, for example, wash the hands before a surgery. Uh, they impair protein synthesis and alter membranes. Chlorine has, is an oxidizing agent, so when it's in combination with water, like when you put bleach in water, right, it forms hypochlorous acid, and that acid is an oxidizing agent that is going to shut down enzymes. Um, alcohols super effective too. So I forgot to mention, iodine, chlorine, super effective. Alcohol, super effective, except for endospores. It does not kill endospores, okay? So you need to, and it doesn't kill non-enveloped virus. The virus have that lipid envelope around their, um, their capsid, and um, if the virus does not have an envelope, which is made of lipid, then alcohol is not going to be able to act because alcohol dissolves lipids, right? For ethanol and isopropanol to work properly, you need to add water. That's the best way to keep it efficient. So between 65 and 85% of ethanol, so this range here is the best one because you're adding water, and as you're adding water, the ethanol is going to be a little diluted. It's going to be cheaper because you're adding water. And it's going to be much more efficient, look at this, than if you just use ethanol 100%. Then you see growth. It doesn't kill if there's no water present, okay? Surface active agents, or what we call, you're going to see this name too, surfactant. <laughs> surfactants. Um, so you have acid anionic sanitizers that react with plasma membrane and you have quaternary ammonium compounds we have a po which have a positive charge. So this has negative charge, this has positive charge. The positive charge ones, soaps, denature proteins, okay? Acid anionic sanitizers are usually most of the um, sanitizers that we see. Um, but the quaternary ammonium is the one that we usually, the commercial one is the one we call zephyrin, which has benzalkonium chloride. So they're used for skin and membrane, mucous membrane disinfection, in like before surgery on the skin of the patient or inside the patient body. You can use zephyrin as a disinfectant and also for hospital utensils. You can use this for disinfect materials. When we talk about general soap, those are de-germane. So what is de-germane? You are not, that's right here, not a killer. Meaning what? When you use water with soap, and you scrub, you, the friction with your hand is going to make that water emulsify with the lipids from your hand, with the oil, and that emulsification drugs the bacteria together, 
carry the bacteria with it. So when you wash your hand and you wash the soap out of your hand, the bacteria is stuck in that emulsion and it's washed out. Okay, so you're not killing, you are removing when you're using soap, removing bacteria. Um, aldehydes. Aldehydes are used um, for preserving specimens usually, but they can also be used for sterilizing materials. So formaldehyde, glutaraldehyde, they all inactivate protein by cross-linking their functional groups and uh, the protein is not functional anymore. Another chemical process is by using a gas that is called ethylene oxide. This is an alkylating agent. What is that? It inserts carbons into molecules and that happens usually in the DNA. So those carbons that are inserted, those methyl groups or many different, could be ethyl, it could be different chains of carbon that are inserted in the DNA make it dysfunctional, so the microbe dies. What is the problem with this? I mean, the, my, it, it's more bacteriostatic, but when they stop growing, they end up dying, right? The problem with this ethylene oxide, even though super efficient, easy to use, um, is that these free radicals that are formed are usually, usually affect the, the people that are working in this sterilization process. So it's very easy for people to get contaminated with this gas because it's a gas and also it, call, it, it leaves residue in equip, equipment. So you're going to use an equipment in a patient that has the residue and that residue can cause some types of cancers. For example, you, have, you can cause biethylene oxide, leukemia, stomach cancer, cancer of pancreas, um, so in the patient. So these residues are harmful. So that's why it's important to always use uh, ethylene oxide to the limit set by the agencies that regulate its use. Okay, there are some standards for use this because excess can be really harmful. Okay, done with chapter seven. This is a short one, even though it's long in the book, I try to really summarize so we just focus on the main points. I will see you again when we talk about chapter eight. Bye.